we're live. And we are live. Well, thank you for uh, everyone that uh, has made uh, and put time aside for our webinar today, um, which is safe and protect in, time, in times of reset. And we'll be uh, talking today um, with uh, David Bloom, who is intellectual property specialist at Safeguards IP, an IP insurance company, as well as uh, Richard Nudgen, head of uh, IP strategy for uh, Color IP. Um, I'll be chairing the session. My name is uh, Timo. I am CEO for Cosmonauts as well as Pekama, uh, an IP intelligence platform that does a bunch of cool stuff. Um, which we're always happy to show you guys. Uh, but uh, really, we'll be talking about how to manage uh, intellectual property budget today. We'll be talking about mitigating risk, uh, as well as uh, unlocking new opportunities um, and being a bit more entrepreneurial with your IP portfolio. Uh, and that goes both for um, attorneys out there servicing IP portfolios of customers, but also IP managers and, and, and CTOs and whoever may be managing the portfolio in, in uh, SMEs and in large uh, organizations. Uh, but before we start, uh, we maybe get uh, a few words from both uh, Richard and David here uh, on, on their experience, of course, but I, I have two specific questions to each and, and one of you, and I start with you, David. Uh, what is IP insurance? I mean, this is something that uh, m most people um, maybe scratch their head around and, and ask you, is that thing even exist? It does. It certainly does exist. And it's been, <laughs> as, if you look at the polls, I've said a question as to when the first policy was sold in the UK, and it's, uh, you might be surprised by the answer. So it certainly exists. It's been around for some time. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's a product that's certainly developed over time and in the last two or three years has really come into its own. Uh, just by way of background, um, Safeguard IP is the UK's only dedicated IT, IP insurance broker. I founded it about four years ago, um, but in my previous life, I was an IP litigator for 15 years in London. Um, and throughout my career, I had uh, great companies, IP rich companies that had done all the right things in terms of capturing their IP, registering it in terms of patents, spending considerable sums of money. But actually when issues arose in terms of third parties copying their IP or then being sued for IP infringement, um, they were always shocked um, when I told them how much it might cost to um, deal with those claims. IP lawyers, unfortunately, are very expensive. Um, so uh, about four or five years ago, I, I looked at ways where uh, companies, um, IP rich companies, can mitigate that particular cost risk and uh, set up Safeguard IP and work with some insurance companies to develop um, some products that are really um, valuable uh, in that regard. Um, so I like to think in the first half of my career, I uh, helped... Uh, clients save save their IP at a high uh, cost, but now I look to save companies' costs by um, advising them on IP insurance. And the way it works essentially is if a claim arises and you have a policy in place, um, the insurer will fund the cost of either enforcing your IP or defending an action against a claim that you've infringed someone else's IP. So at the very basic level, that's what they do. Fantastic. Well, that actually leads us to the to the, our first poll question, which was uh, put together by, by you, David. And the question is, in what year was the first IP insurance policy sold in the UK? Um, we've got a few answers already, uh, and, and, and they are on the year 1996. Please don't reveal the answer yet. Uh, we'll, we'll do so at the end. Um, and in the meantime, um, we have uh, Richard here. Um, uh, on behalf of uh, Color IP, uh, can you tell us a bit more about, about yourself, Richard, about Color and, and really what, what is IP strategy? I think that it, it probably means different things for different people. Yes. Um, so, hello, I'm, I'm Richard Nugent. I work at Color IP as head of IP strategy. And, um, you know, my experience has, it, it began also a bit like David. Um, you know, more in a, a legal uh, sector. Um, however, I moved fairly quickly from, from contracts into IP and then began managing IP um, assets within a company, a research entity, and then also um, managing their contracts at that time. Uh, later, I moved into IP consulting 
and uh, that it sort of was a fairly natural flow. Um, and then now I'm you know, at Color IP the past uh, few years. Um, so, you know, our work at um, Color is, is very much focused on IP commercialization. Um, so that ranges from anything from, you know, auditing assets and helping people with their intangible assets right through to valuation and transactions. Um, and in terms of what is IP strategy, well, IP strategy, you're absolutely right, Timo. It does mean many things to, to many people. But uh, for us, really what IP strategy is about is, is helping people to, to access uh, and, and drive revenue from their, their intangible assets and to make the most of their intangible assets. Um, so it's also helping them to do this in a way which is nimble and helps them avoid um, avoid problems as they go down that path, whilst at the same time unlocking the the, the, the most opportunities possible. Thank you, thank you, Richard. Um, so I'm going to be ending the poll, guys, in about two minutes. So last tries to answer the question. Um, I mean, certainly now we have uh, all the time uh, in the world to actually slow down, uh, reflect on things, reflect on practices that uh, um, we have been religiously following for, 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 for years, if you, if, if you wish. Practices that we all know that are imperfect, but, but work well enough uh, for, for, for us to carry on. Um, I mean, we have the time now to, uh, you know, maybe think of alternatives. So. To IP owners out there, what they should be prioritizing or at least paying closer attention to right now? Do you guys think that should be um, putting a bit more rationale uh, around spending, um, maybe looking at alternative providers, maybe even looking at alternative uh, ways of, 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 of doing things? Um, should they be looking more at trying to generate alternative revenue using their IP portfolio, uh, whether that will be through licensing or even prosecution, or whether uh, or whether should be focusing more on protection. And I'm not just talking about the conventional um, sense of protection, which is, okay, let's patent, let's trademark stuff, uh, you know, let's, let's cover our trade secrets, but also looking at IP insurance, for example. I mean, I think that what's been happening to us has definitely made us uh, think differently about risk. And how we should uh, be prepared. You have frozen on us, Timo. Excuse me. You, you froze there. Oh, I froze there. How about now? All good. All good. Yeah, it's good. So, so maybe maybe go uh, go to you first, uh, Richard. Um, maybe maybe you tell us a bit more about alternative uh, revenue streams uh, using intellectual property to the ones that are are, are kind of commonly known. Certainly. Um, I might have gone into audio only mode. Uh, I'm getting a notification here on, uh, on connection uh, issues, but um, that, that could well be on my side. Um, that, that's all right. We can hear you loud and clear. We cannot see you that, loud, but I'm good. sure we can see um, that. I think in terms of you know, accessing you know, new opportunities um, and new revenue streams, I think what we find is that uh, you know, this is a time where companies can really take a long, hard look at the intangible assets they have. And once they look at those assets, they can either decide that maybe it's the time to move on, move past some some of those assets and defocus from them. But it could also be an opportunity to look at what assets are able to generate revenue that maybe aren't generating revenue right now. So that could be either um, selling the IP or licensing out the IP or using it indeed within their own business in perhaps a way that it hasn't been used before. Maybe it wasn't being used properly before. Um, so there, there's those sorts of um, you know, revenue opportunities. Um, it, it's also an opportunity to, to look at what else is out there, perhaps look at the, the sort of white space in their, in their particular uh, technical domain and see what opportunities are there that they could be getting into um, if, if they wanted to redirect their activities in that direction. And, and sometimes that can be funded by you know, dropping certain assets 
or dropping a certain technical direction because you know sometimes we find working with companies that they might have a particular asset but they're actually not using it and none of their particular you know product lines or revenue streams are directed towards the protection they get from that intangible asset so just um, spending a bit of time to to do that sort of uh, introspection if you like but also a uh, and a sort of a, a, a bit of a research into the market and the market dynamics, um, looking at the looking at competitors, that can be a great opportunity uh, at this time. So I think it's a great opportunity to do that and a great opportunity to innovate in this um, in this situation. Being being a bit more entrepreneurial, if you wish. Absolutely. Yeah. And and we were we were actually talking about uh, that yesterday. We touched upon the fact that uh, often no one wants to make that code though. Uh, you know, yep. people people don't want to be uh, don't want to be the person that says, okay, we'll stop renewing that patent. Uh, you know, maybe we shouldn't be filing in in X Y Z jurisdiction. You know, maybe maybe we shouldn't be expanding on the classes. Um, that actually leads us to um, a question not so related on onto uh, our our post here. So well, we've got a question. When looking for a, a tech solution for your IP, what are you looking for? Uh, cost, scalability, brand. None of the above. Uh, we have four answers so far, and they're all different. Um, you know, we found ourselves in a, in a bit of an interesting situation, um, to say the least. Um, and in the in the IP world, we've seen a lot of calls for open innovation. Um, whether that's going to be open innovation in relation specifically to, to, to solving the pandemic that we found ourselves in or, or overall. Um, in your line of business, when it comes to open innovation, uh, what do you think are the complications that can arise uh, from, from, from that? Maybe, maybe start with, with you, David, from, from an insurance perspective. Uh, oh, it's hideous. <laughs> It helps. <laughs> um, I mean, it, uh, all open innovation will be subject to certain rules and regulations agreed between the parties. And uh, as we all know, um, anything that's written down in an agreement is open to interpretation. So uh, if people are sharing IP, it, it can lead to disputes one way or another. Uh, in principle, if everyone's sharing all IP, then there will be no disputes. But if you're just sharing a pool of, say, patents, uh, then th th there is always a concern that um, someone will um, go beyond the scope of the license in error or it, 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 um, on purpose. So there, there's that additional risk that one minute they're using it within the scope of a license um, that's been granted and and then for whatever reason they're not and then the dispute arises so there's always that additional risk i mean what what i have seen a lot of been reading a lot of in the last couple of weeks is how companies are pooling patents a lot of tech companies are pooling their patents that they think might be helpful in dealing with a pandemic and giving standard licenses to third parties to use um and i see that the licenses would expire exactly a year after the who um confirm the pandemic has passed. So whilst there, there wouldn't be any litigation during that period, it, it's difficult to know if there will be a huge uptick in litigation beyond the expiry of those licenses for, for you know people carrying on um, using the patents when they're, they're not licensed to do so. So in theory, it's a, obviously it's a good thing, certainly at the moment, but in terms of the, the litigation risk, it's it can be a bit messy. So thank you very much. Uh, you have a great day. Thanks, and, so much. And, and great weekend. Bye.